Living Truth invites viewers to attend a very special evening with Charles Price. Join us at one of our celebration events across Canada. We praise God for the work he's doing through the ministry of Living Truth here in Canada and around the world. You'll be encouraged to hear how lives are changing as people hear the Word of God in our weekly television broadcast. Hear about the missions projects Living Truth supports in Africa and India. Charles has some wonderful experiences in India to share with you. Over 100,000 people gathered recently to hear him preach. Your feet must be on holy ground set apart for me. Living Truth is now broadcast across Canada on six different networks, as well as around the world, in the UK, Europe, the Middle East, India, and Australia. And in this past year, a whole new broadcast area has opened up in Korea. Where is God calling us next? Find out at these celebration evenings across Canada. These events are free, and you'll be given the opportunity to partner financially with Living Truth as we take Christ to the nations. We invite you to gather at these banquets and rallies for special music and a personal message from Charles. Join us in Cambridge, Ontario, Friday, May 16th. Cowichan Bay, B.C., Tuesday, May 27th. Victoria, Wednesday, May 28th. Abbotsford, Thursday, May 29th. Vancouver, Friday, May 30th. And in London, Ontario, Friday, June 20th. Call 416-222-3341, extension 156, to find out locations in your area. Or visit our website at livingtruth.ca. Don't miss this opportunity to be encouraged in your faith. The Bible teaches us that we are to trust and obey God. But sometimes our faith is put to the test. Living Truth takes to the streets to ask people if God has tested them. And how does that affect their faith? Have I ever felt that God was testing me? Um, yes, pretty much every day of my life. Well, if when you're being tested, you say, where is, where where is God? Why is he letting this happen to me? My faith is tested on a daily basis. Uh, the things you see in the news, the uh, things that happen around you, absolutely. You wonder, is there God and what's he doing to us? I've been in situations in younger years where had I not have strength in my faith and belief in God, I wouldn't be here today. I believe that Earth is hell for us because this is our test here. And if we do pass the test, that's where we're going to be ending up into heaven. So. Sometimes I go through at times and I say, God, are you really there? And um, that's when I go back to the scriptures and I see many people like Job who, who has tested his faith. And I see him as an example. I've been tested on more than one occasion. And um, it's, it's only my faith in him and belief in him and his love that, it, that has kept me pushing forward. So, yes, I've been tested many times. God tested Abraham when he asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. On today's program, Charles Price teaches from this well-known story, The Testing of Abraham. you got your Bible this morning, I'm going to read to you from Genesis and chapter 22. If you've been with us on previous weeks, you'll know we've been looking into this story of Abraham and learning a lot of the lessons that Abraham had to learn and that we have to learn. And we're going to look at one of the key issues in his life this morning. Let me read to you from chapter 22 and verse 1, where it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. 
Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called after him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. That's as far as I'm going to read of that familiar story. If we were to draw a graph of Abraham's life, it would probably look a little bit like the Himalayan mountain range with some staggering pinnacles of trust and obedience and daring interspersed with deep valleys of doubt and disobedience and waywardness. That's probably true for most people, actually. And one of the things we love about Scripture, of course, is the honesty with which it tells the story of his leading characters. But I suggest to you that the Mount Everest of the Himalayan range of Abraham's walk of faith would be this event here in Genesis 22. It stands as the climax of God's dealings with him. And Abraham responds unflinchingly to the most unreasonable demand anybody could ever make of anyone, and this is God making this seemingly unreasonable demand of Abraham. I'm sure that after Isaac was born, after long years of waiting and promises that didn't seem to be being fulfilled, and periods of frustration and mishaps and failures, and disappointments. I'm sure Abraham thought, now at last, that Isaac has been given to us. All these storms have now blown over. But instead, he faces the most severe storm of all. He is told to offer his son Isaac in sacrifice as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. And I want to talk about this this morning with you from three different perspectives. I want to talk first about what it says about God. And then I want to talk about what it says about Abraham. And then what it says to you and me, to us today. What is its message for us? First of all, Let's look at what this says about God. I'm sure most of us feel that we're not really sure we understand God very well at this point. All the promises he's made are vested in this son Isaac, and God says, take this son whom you love, almost rubbing it in, whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice in Mount Moriah. You know, I think... Many of us are tempted to think of God as a great benevolent figure whose main interest is in making us feel good about ourselves and about our circumstances. I, I kid you not. That is the expectation many people have of God and his working in their lives. We sort of think of him almost as being in the role of the recreational director of a cruise ship. <laughs> And uh, he's at work on our behalf to make sure that we're having a good time and everything's falling into place and everything is smooth. And we look back and say, hey, that was, a, that was a great time. But that actually is not the case. God has much bigger interests than that. We must let God, by his 
words and by his actions show us what he is really about. And one of the things he's about is molding us and making us into the kind of people he wants us to be. And all of us here this morning are unfinished products. And like the analogy that Jeremiah uses in Jeremiah 18, God is like the potter molding the clay. And when the clay begins to take on some form that is not what the potter has in mind, he remolds it to make it something as he sees good, as Jeremiah said. And this is a never-ending process. God is molding and remolding us all the time. We never arrive at that point where we sit back and say, well, this is it, just cruise for the next 20 years until I end up in heaven. God is the initiator of this whole experience, and Abraham is old now, of course, and it begins sometime later, God tested Abraham. Maybe we don't like that idea, but in the New Testament, James explains it to us, because in James chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3, he writes this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, here's the point. The testing of your faith produces. It's productive. It's Creative, it's constructive. It leaves you better at the end of it. And James says, you know, that, that that you face trials of many kinds. And so this is not unique to Abraham. That God should test him. There's a whole range of ways in which God may test us, but the common denominator probably is that it's in ways that we wish he didn't, in ways that we don't like and in ways that are not comfortable James calls them trials of many kinds by which he is testing our faith maybe where some of you are actually right now in some way in which God is testing you now it's very interesting that the offering that Abraham was asked to make is described four times as a burnt offering. Uh, verse 2, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. And in verse 3 and verse 6 and again in verse 7, he describes this as being a burnt offering. Which means this is not just any offering. This is not just making a sacrifice. It's a very specific thing. It's a burnt offering. Now what is a burnt offering? It's never mentioned again until you get to Moses in the wilderness. And when Moses was in the wilderness, God gave him instructions as to how men and women could approach God under the old covenant, centered on a tabernacle which had within it a place called the Holy of Holies, where God said, there I'll meet with you. And to get into the Holy of Holies, there was a lot of things involved in the process. And amongst other things, he gave them five offerings. There was a guilt offering. If you use the... King James is called the trespass offering. There was a sin offering. There was the fellowship offering. Then there was the grain offering, sometimes called the meal offering. And then finally the burnt offering. Now, this book of Genesis we call the first book of Moses. And so it's likely that the writer is looking now from the vantage point of Moses' time, looking back and saying, I understand exactly what this offering is. It's a burnt offering. I know exactly what that is because God has instituted to us a series of offerings, the final climax of which is the burnt offering. And in order to help us to understand what's going on here in this testing of Abraham. Let me just very, very briefly review for you these five offerings and just to let you know what they are, because the whole of the Christian life is encompassed within them. And the best way I can think of explaining them to you is by asking you to imagine that I'm sitting outside the tabernacle in the wilderness, and I see a man coming towards the tabernacle, and he's leading a lamb, a little female lamb. Now, it may be something else, it could be a ram, it, there are all kinds of possibilities, but a lamb was one option, it, it was a, leading a lamb, and I watch him as he comes to the priest who picks up the lamb and examines it to make sure there's no blemish in it, and then he takes the lamb, puts it on an altar, which was outside in the courtyard of the tabernacle, 
and he kills it. And his blood is shed, and the priest does certain things with the blood and the carcass of this animal. And then the man turns and leaves, and as he leaves, I want you to imagine, I go to him and say, excuse me, what in the world were you doing there? And he would say, well, I realize that I've been guilty of certain sins, the things I've been doing that I know are wrong, and my conscience has been troubled by this, and I've been seeking a way to be forgiven, and I'm understanding that the only way to be forgiven is to bring this lamb as my substitute and to offer it in sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And so I say, you mean that innocent lamb had to die for you to be forgiven? He says, yes. And then he leaves, and the next day I'm sitting outside the tabernacle, and I, I see the same man coming back. And this time he he's leading a goat. And I call out to him and say, have you been committing more sins? What's this about? And he'll say, well, well, no, it's not more sins. I'm afraid it's all connected with the same sin as yesterday. But I thought you dealt with that, what, what I did. But I've been thinking about it and I realized that it's not just what I do that is my problem, actually. It's what I am that is my problem. I do what I do because of what I am. I have a nature that is corrupt, that is sinful. And so you see, this goat is for a sin offering. Not sins, not what I do, it's what I am. And I lay my hand on this goat, I identify myself with this goat, and I take it to the priest, and the priest sacrifices it. And we're saying symbolically, what I am has been put to death. And I say, that's very interesting. And he goes through the process, returns home. Next day, I'm sitting outside the tabernacle, and I see the same man coming back again. And this time, he's bringing a sheep with him. And I say, what is all this about? Have you been committing another sin? He said, no, no, it's all connected with the same sin. You see, I realize I need to be forgiven of my guilt. That was the guilt offering. I realize the cause is my sin, my nature, myself. That's the sin offering. But, you know, it's not just enough getting rid of that sin. I need to be restored to fellowship and intimacy with God. And this fellowship offering this sheep is about being reconciled to an intimacy with God and a connection with God and a fellowship with God and, and so he goes through the rituals and then he leaves and next day I'm sitting outside the tabernacle again the same man comes and this time he's carrying a tray with some looks like some cakes and some breads and I say what do you got this time he say well you know these are th these are some some cakes and bread and they're made with some fine flour and uh, unleavened there's no yeast in it at all because that's a picture of sin and uh, there's oil that's not only in the cakes but sprinkled all over them and that oil represents the Holy Spirit and I realize it's not just getting my, my spiritual life right I realize that God wants to be involved in every single part of my life so this represents you see the work of my hands this represents my business this represents what I do from Monday to Friday as well as over the weekends when I come and maybe I'm here at the tabernacle I'm saying God every part of my life is sacred it's the meal offering that says Monday to Friday is as sacred as Saturday and Sunday I'm giving it to him and then the fifth day, I'm sitting outside Tabernacle, and this man, same man, comes carrying, this time, a, leading a bull. It doesn't have to be a bull. It could have been a, a lamb, a sheep. It could even be actually a dove, but it's a bull he's bringing. And I go to him and say, man, you must have committed some big sin this time. Look at the size of that bull. He says, no, no, it's all about the same sin. You see, I was forgiven in the guilt offering. Myself was dealt with in the sin offering. My reconciliation to fellowship with God in the fellowship offering. My whole life, what I do, I present to him in the meal offering. But I realize, you know, it's not just giving bits and pieces, saying, God, oh, well, here's my business, and here's my family, and here's my money. And It's actually a burnt offering which says everything that I am and have and ever hope to be is symbolized by this bull. I lay my hands on this bull, it's put onto the altar, a fire is lit, and the fire must not go out. It'll burn all night in the morning when the priest gets up. He'll throw more wood on that fire until every last possible little bit is burned up. There's no trace of the bull left anywhere at all. And you know what it'll be? It's going to arise and ascend as a sweet-smelling aroma to God. It means that every single thing has been laid on the altar before God. It's called the burnt offering. Now you recognize 
And I've just given you a summary of the book of Leviticus, by the way. And maybe sometime we'll go through Leviticus. Because there's tremendous truth in there about the Christian life. But you'll recognize that's a beautiful foreshadowing of the Christian life, of course. That Christ died for me. The guilt offering. Not only that, I died in Christ. Crucified with Christ. The sin offering. For what purpose? That I live, but not I. The Christ lives in me. The fellowship offering. Reconciled to God that I might be saved by his life. And then there's the presenting all that I am, allowing him as Lord to govern every part of my life. What happens on Sunday, what happens on Monday, what happens on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But even that is not it. It's not just the piecemeal of surrendering this and surrendering that and surrendering the other to his Lordship. That's all part of the process. But the burnt offering is coming as in Romans 12. And Romans, by the way, is an exposition of those, of those offerings in the Old Testament. And in Romans 12, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service, as some translations put it. This is your spiritual act of worship, as some translations put it. And Abraham in Genesis 22 called this burnt offering. We are going yonder to worship, he said. This is what it is. It's presenting the burnt offering. And so what Abraham is doing here is bringing in his son Isaac representative of everything that makes Abraham's life make sense. His past, his present, his future, all the promises that God has ever made to Abraham are vested in this son Isaac, as we'll see in a few moments. And he's saying, take that son and offer him as a burnt offering. Where Abraham, you let everything go. This is both the most painful of things you can ever do before God and at the same time the most liberating of all things you can ever do before God. It was both for Abraham. And from God's point of view, he is saying in this act, I'm not just asking you, Abraham, for bits and pieces. I'm asking you for lock, stock and barrel, put it on an altar and slay it. It's a burnt offering. So there's nothing left that belongs to Abraham. It's all given and belongs to God. So this is what it tells us about God. He's not just being awkward. Well, let's see how far Abraham will go. Let's think of the worst thing to ask him to do. No, he's saying, Abraham, I want you to live in the dynamic of a relationship that is going to be effective and fruitful, but this is what it's going to cost. And he'll say the same to you. And the same to me. So that's what it tells us about God. Secondly, what does it tell us about Abraham? There's several things here that have a familiar ring about them with Abraham. Let me read to you verse 2. It says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Listen, one of the mountains I will tell you about. Does that ring a bell? Well, you may remember that years before in chapter 12 and verse 1, when God called Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, and he said, leave your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Now, God seems to be deliberately ambiguous with Abraham. Go to the land, and when you get there, I'll show you where it is. But I'm not telling you where it is in the meantime. Abraham, go to Mount Moriah, and I'm not going to tell you which mountain. There's a range of mountains on Moriah. I'll tell you when you get there. We talked about this, of course, several weeks ago, and we made the point then that the issue for Abraham in not knowing where he was going, as when Jesus called his disciples to follow me, he didn't tell them where they were going, because the issue is never where we're going. The issue is who we're going there with. Abraham, I'm deliberately leaving it ambiguous, because last time when you set off, you actually kept deviating, spent time in Haran, and then when there was a famine, you went down into Egypt. Abraham is having his direction tested again, his willingness to let God guide him at the last moment. Which mountain? I'll show you when you get there. 
And in verse 3, it then says, Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. I remember speaking that on one occasion and saying that this is an indication of Abraham's immediate obedience. Early the next morning, got up and left. And my wife, Hillary, was sitting there and she corrected me afterwards, at least she called it a correction. She said, I don't think it was because he was desperate to obey. I think he got up and left early so that uh, Sarah would not know. Which is a very wise piece of insight from a mother. I said to her, so you mean to say Sarah wouldn't be up early in the morning? Is that what you're saying? (laughs) But of course, as usual, when my wife speaks, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Because I'll tell you something. That when God leads and guides and directs us, sometimes we have to walk alone. He probably didn't tell Sarah... He left the two servants at the foot of the mountain and did not tell them what he was doing, though he said, we will go and worship and we will come back to you. He didn't tell Isaac what was going to happen as they went up the mountain. Isaac said, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, where's the lamb? And and Abraham said, God will provide the lamb. He, He didn't let Isaac know what the real story was. And you know, very often some of the most intimate workings of God in our own hearts take place in solitude and sometimes you have to walk alone and you have to be willing to walk alone some of the deepest work of God in our lives is done alone and I'm sure there were tears in Abraham's heart even though they were hidden from his face towards his son sometimes you have to be misunderstood and by the way if you can't handle being misunderstood you probably won't get very far with God because you keep wanting to explain everything and justify everything and you can't do that you have to allow yourself to be misunderstood sometimes there's a secret place in the heart of all of us when God often does his best work there's a huge mixture at this point There's this obedience to God, that's clear. Go to Mount Moriah and I'll show you which mountain on which to sacrifice as a burnt offering, Isaac. But there's also trust. God has not told me what the end of this story is. And as Abraham walks from Beersheba, because he'd now moved down to Beersheba in chapter 21, it's a three-day journey from Beersheba up to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, of course, is the location today where Jerusalem is. I remember once preaching in Beersheba over a weekend and then on the Monday morning driving up to Jerusalem and thinking of Abraham, looking at the northern part of Negev, it's pretty flat, easy going at first and then you get to the base of the whole mountain range and it's a long, steep, twisty turning road up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city set on a hill and it's surrounded by various peaks one of which was the one on which Abraham was told to offer Isaac. We don't know which one, despite the fact when you go there, they'll tell you which one, but we don't know. Do you know how we know that he obeyed unflinchingly? Because he did not look for an opt-out as they walked there. You see, the walk is obey and trust. Obey and trust. Do what he says and trust who he is. And sometimes you don't know what he's going to do. Many times you don't know what he's going to do. And sometimes the obedience and the trust seem to collide. They seem to be in collision as they are here. Because God has made a promise to Abraham about Isaac in chapter 21. It says, through Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned. That's the promise. Well, God, you promised me through Isaac. Now, Isaac, we don't know how old he was. Probably a teenager. Big enough to carry the wood and the fire up the mountain while his father carried the knife he was old Isaac was young fit but we don't know how old he was we can only speculate about that and the promise is that through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned that's the promise but here in collision with that promise is the command offer him as a burnt offering And the promise and the command seem to collide. Now, it's easy to stumble over such a dilemma. And what God seems to command and what God seems to promise clash. 
Now mature faith, such as that evidenced in Abraham at this stage, will trust the hidden wisdom of God, that in the course of time it will make itself known despite the lack of human reasoning. But sometimes because that waiting is so excruciating, many people at this point simply abandon their trust in God and they take the safe option. And they'll cling to the fact that through Isaac that you promised and so I can't let Isaac go, I must have misunderstood anything else. This is probably all part of the test. You see, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And Abraham had to learn here that the consequences of his obedience was not his responsibility. And when you genuinely trust, here's how you know you trust, you take your hands off the consequences. Did Abraham expect that all of this would be called off at the last moment? I don't know. We did expect that something would happen. There are three options that we know about that Abraham had thought about. One option was in chapter 22, verse 5, when they got lament and he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship then. We will come back to you. Now, that's a statement of faith by Abraham. We will come back to you. Plural, both of us. Now, how he was expecting to bring his son back, he doesn't say, but that was one thing that, that, that he thought, well, whatever's going to happen here, I know that Isaac will come back with me. Second option was that, verse 7, as they were going up the mountain, Isaac spoke and said to his father, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them, it says, went on together. And I'm sure in the silence of their walking up the hillside, Abraham thought, God will provide the lamb, but where, what, how, when? I have no idea. It's not my responsibility. God, I'm scared to death. But I'm going to trust you. And the third option was one which we find in the book of Hebrews where it speaks about this in Hebrews 11 verse 19 where the writer of the Hebrews says that Abraham reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. The final resort Abraham reasoned was that the knife will actually go into Isaac and he will die and I will light the fire and I'll burn him all up as the burnt offering is supposed to be. But God will raise him from the dead. Abraham didn't know what would happen. All these options ran through his mind. He just knew this. You obey and you trust. You obey and you trust. Trust and obey. But there's no other way. Remember that song? To be happy in Jesus, but trust and obey. Easy to sing. But we have to live it on Monday mornings too. And do you remember how the, when they got up to the mountain and they made the altar together, Isaac helping him? I don't know whether Abraham made this in some kind of game. I don't know whether it was fun to build the altar or what Isaac was thinking. And then bound him, we'll comment on this in a moment, and lay him on the altar, took the knife and was ready to slay him, having drawn the knife out of his sheath and God intervened. Abraham wasn't faking it. He was intent to go all the way. And God said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know that you fear God. By the way, we won't talk about that, but that's the first time it speaks of the fear of God. If you want to know what the fear of God is, you have to read this story. Now I know that you fear God. But the third thing, what it tells us about God, what it tells us about Abraham, what does it tell us about ourselves? You see, James tells us that this has something to do with us. Where in the verse I read earlier, James 1, 2, and 3, Consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces endurance. He's saying, you've got to understand, your faith is going to be tested to produce something better. And I suggest that there are three things here that Abraham went through that you and I have to go through. The first thing I suggest to you is that he was letting his possessions go. 
Isaac was his most treasured possession. A.W. Tozer says that Isaac may have become an idol to Abraham. He was born in Abraham's old age. After years of promise, the boy Isaac represented everything sacred to his father's heart. All the purposes that God had declared about Abraham's seed would come through Isaac. God's purposes for a nation there would be a source of blessing the world would come through Isaac. The Messiah, the seed, singular, of Abraham, Christ, would come through Isaac. And recognizing that all that God had promised and all that his life had been about, all that his journey from Ur of the Chaldeans had been about, all that his struggles had been about, was that Isaac would be the means by which everything is going to be channeled and fulfilled. And his love for Isaac grew. In fact, when God called him to offer Isaac, he, he said specifically, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Well, of course, every father loves his child. But maybe there's something, as Tozer suggests, more significant about this, that Isaac has become the primary object of your love, Abraham. And I quote from Tozer, he says, God stepped in to save both father and son from an uncleansed love. You know, when something that's given to us by God becomes a substitute for God, it becomes a hindrance, not a blessing. And very often that can happen. Something given by God becomes a substitute for God. And it is that to which we look instead of God. It is that in which we place our trust instead of God. It's that which is the focus of our hope instead of God. And maybe this is Abraham wrapped up in his son Isaac. The second thing maybe from this is that we have to let our children go. I don't mean that we would ever say, I'd be willing for my son or daughter to be offered in some kind of sacrifice. Of course, this is a unique situation here. And none of us, for any reason, would think that way. But I want to suggest to you that he let Isaac go here in a way which I think is very important. In the last couple of days, I've been trying to get into Isaac's skin and ask him, what was it like for Isaac? And I suddenly clicked something here which I want to share with you. Isaac trusted his father. And he trusted his father's God. That's evident when, when he asked the question, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And, and his father Abraham answered, God will provide a lamb. Isaac trusted his father's statement, and he trusted his father's statement about God. God will provide the lamb, because there are no more questions after that. Okay, Dad? I trust you. And they built the altar together. What kind of dialogue went between them as they were building the altar, I don't know. But the time came when Abraham probably came up behind Isaac and he put his arm around Isaac. That's a nice gesture any father might do with his son. And Abraham, uh, Isaac probably felt very secure in the arm of his father. And then with his other hand, Abraham produced a rope and began to wrap the rope around his son. And Isaac probably still thought, well, Dad, I'm not quite sure what you're doing. But I trust you. There was no panic. Isaac, presumably, was stronger than Abraham at this point in his life. He was faster than Abraham. He could have wriggled out of any situation and run away. Of course he could have done, but he trusted his father. I mean, this is his dad. He's played with me since I was a kid. He helped me to learn to walk. He's carried me on his shoulders. He's tucked me up in bed at night. He, he taught me to ride a bike. He's played ball with me out in the yard. He helped me learn to read and to write. I would trust my dad with anything. What's he doing? I don't know, but I trust him. And as he was laying onto the altar, and Isaac knew full well what you did with an altar. That's why I asked the question, where's the land? 
he still was trusting his father. And then probably a sense of horror began to develop in his own heart as he saw his father take the knife out of its sheath and he stretched it out, it says, with a knife ready to plunge into Isaac. At this point, Isaac's mind must have been in utter bewilderment. Dad, I don't know what you're doing. What are you doing? And I suggest to you in that moment, something happened to Isaac. His trust moved from his father to God. You see, prior to this moment, he trusted his father's God. That is totally natural. When kids grow up in our home, they trust the God of their parents. When folks come to know Christ for the first time, their framework is very limited. They trust the God of the person who led them to Christ, or they trust the God of their church, or they trust the God of their pastor, or they trust the God of some friend. That's perfectly natural. God often introduced himself in that way. I'm the God of your fathers. I'm the God of Abraham. Somebody else is God, but something had to happen to Isaac where God became his God. You see, when we don't have our own trust in God, we may be Christian. But if somebody else fails as often they might, we turn away because we don't have our own trust in God. We feel disillusioned because somebody else has failed. When Isaac came down the mountain, you can be sure he was a different boy in his relationship with God. Dad, I trust you and I still trust you. You're my dad. But I now have a trust in God that was independent of you, that bypassed you. In that final moment to which God allowed Abraham to go because his arm was stretched out. There was nothing to do now but allow his hand to come down and knife, push the knife into his son. In that last moment, God intervened. In that last moment, when Abraham's obedience is right at the limit, when Isaac's trust has had to switch from his father to God himself, God says, now I know that you fear God. You know, it's hard to let our kids go. It's hard to let our kids have to discover God for themselves because they're in situations that are difficult. And by the way, you don't discover God for yourself sitting like this on Sunday morning. We get the information, but you discover it in the nitty-gritty of life when it's tough and hard and your back's against the wall and things are falling down. And, and you know, as parents, we, we want to intervene. We want to rescue our kids. You've got to stand back sometimes and let them find God for themselves. And the third thing I suggest... Let his possessions go. He let his children go. We have to do that. It's about letting your future go. You see, everything God had promised to Abraham was wrapped up in Isaac. I've mentioned that, of course, already. Every promise was through Isaac. Every sense of purpose that Abraham had was through the son, Isaac, that had been given to him. The blessing of the nations through Isaac. The coming of the Messiah through Isaac. All the future Abraham could ever hope for. All the future Abraham had left Ur the Chaldees for. All the future Abraham lived for was in Isaac. And he's about to slay him. Like most of us, I have been tested and failed on many occasions. As Abraham failed on many occasions. And hopefully our failures become teachers. And we grow because of them. There have been two occasions in my life when God has metaphorically, in this sense, asked me to put the knife into something that was very precious, very important. First time, I can't tell you what they are, of course, they're private, but I remember through tears saying, God, I'm willing to let this go and, in effect, to put the knife into this thing, which is very precious. And in that instance... Almost with a knife in my hand, God intervened and said, Stop. And he gave me back what I thought I was willing then to lose. But he gave me back and it was different. I'll tell you why in a moment. The second event was an event which also was very real and my wife and I together, we had to come to this event, a very real thing, 
And we took the knife, so to speak. And this time the knife did fall and went right into this particular thing. And as far as we were concerned, it was over. It was gone. It was dead. We buried it. We mourned it. And then, as the writer of Hebrews says, God actually raised it from the dead. And he gave it us back. But here's the difference on both occasions. When he gave it us back, it wasn't ours anymore. It was God's. We would take no responsibility for the consequences anymore. This is God's. And I tell you, some of you have been there, many of you will have been there. Maybe God is taking some of you there, and what you're hearing this morning is, as often preaching is, and I often pray it'll be so, that what you're hearing this morning is an explanation of what is going on in your life, in some way. And the climax of the story comes when in Abraham looks up and sees a ram and sacrifices it as a burnt offering. And verse 14 says, Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. On this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The King James keeps the Hebrew intact there. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah the Lord, Jireh, he will provide. He knew Jehovah before this moment, but Jehovah becomes a compound name. There are many compound names to Jehovah. Jehovah, Jireh, in any future situation. And the story begins to slow down now. Abraham does continue for many more years, but the story begins to slow down. Do you know why it begins to slow down? Because there are no more issues to face. And let me say this, when that issue has been settled, every other issue in life has also been settled with it. There are no more issues to face. Just obedience and trust. And you can sleep the sleep of a child every night, wake up in the morning and say, Father, I'm available, I'll get on with the job, but it's not mine, I take no possession of it, I'm not going to manipulate any consequences, I'm just going to trust you. Walk by faith, obedience, and trust. Join us next week for another topic from the series Abraham Living by Faith on a Rocky Road. Charles Price teaches on good grief, dealing with death. 